Hi, I'm Helena Blavatsky. Oh, that's creepy. <laughs> I'm happy for this opportunity to tell you a bit about my thoughts on John Keeley and his works. Mr. Keeley being greatly favored in this respect, and moreover, besides his psychic temperament, being intellectually a genius in mechanics, mm -hmm. may thus achieve most wonderful results. <laughs> My question is, if you've got this all figured out, why don't you just turn it on? All right, believe it or not, I'm still debating whether I even want to attempt to do this video tonight or not. Does talking about Vril ever get old? I feel like it will. I say we just make it a cannonball run. Okay, so uh, The Coming Race, published 1871. Edward Bulwer Lighton dies 1873. The Esophical Society, founded 1875, kind of in the midst of the Vril craze following the publication of The Coming Race. Elena Blavatsky publishes uh, Isis Unveiled in 1877 in two volumes. We talked about the mentions of Vril in that, so now we're going to move on to The Secret Doctrine, published in 1888. Uh, okay, The Secret Doctrine. Let me get my big fat head out of the way here. Only three mentions. We can understand, they say, the necessity for concealing from the herd such secrets as the Vril or the rock-destroying force discovered by J.W. Keeley of Philadelphia. Yeah, so she is tying Vril to this guy. Oh, if the question is asked why Mr. Keeley was not allowed to pass a certain limit, the answer is easy. It was because that which he has unconsciously discovered is the terrible sidereal force. The force known to and named by the Atlantean. So enter Atlantis. You know, I'll do I'll do a different video on Atlantis. It, it ties in, so it's important, but focus. Focus on Vril. Who is this Keeley guy? Mention this Keeley 41 times. Let's go to time number one. Okay, so the time, the first time she mentions Keeley is that sentence about Vril. Let's read it again. We can understand, they say, the necessity for concealing from the herd such secrets as the Vril or the rock-destroying force discovered by J.W. Keeley of Philadelphia. The great Arceus is now publicly discovered by and for only one man, J.W. Keeley of Philadelphia. This guy sounds like really something. He's a big deal. The recently produced phenomena, the so-called Keeley Motor, John Worrell Keeley's etheric force of Philadelphia. Had Keeley been permitted to succeed, he might have reduced a whole army to atoms in the space of a few seconds, as easily as he reduced a dead ox to that condition. In the humble opinion of the occultists, as of his immediate friends, Mr. Keeley was and still is at the threshold of some greatest of some of the greatest secrets of the universe. Let's keep it moving. Keep it moving, Blavatsky. Keeley, Keeley, Keeley. So she's talking about Vril in the context of this Mr. Keeley. Quite a fetching pair of sideburns there. John Ernst Worrell Keeley poses with his non-functional Keeley engine. 1837 to 1898, American fraudster and the self-proclaimed inventor from Philadelphia who claimed to have discovered a new motive power, which was initially described as vaporic or etheric in force. 1872, Keeley invited scientists to a demonstration in his laboratory of a machine that he asserted was motivated by a new and previously unknown force. It is worth noting that 1872 is one year after the publication of the real book, The Coming Race. 1884, Vaporic Gun. So this guy is doing all kinds of stuff. Etheric Generator. These machines produced unlimited energy. This chapter is about Keeley and about occult science and the mystery of the machines that Keeley had developed. Okay. There he is. There's our friend. So, and he was adamant that it was the ether that with his machines he was able to imprison the ether and also to be able to release the ether baffled many people, especially since Keeley was very secretive about his workings. Mm -hmm. Another big problem was that the machines only worked when he, Keeley, was around. Though he says he discovered the force, he also was the force. The force is strong, is He made the machines work through himself, either using his willpower or because he was in some way attuned to the ether. It's time to cut to the chase here. He was rounding up money from investors to finance inventions of his and these machines and there's all kinds of literature and stuff on this guy and i'm only just scratching the surface the short version is uh the machines only worked when he was running them <laughs> after the guy dies they go in and they look in his laboratory oh there we go here's the illustration from wikipedia so it's got his laboratory up here and there's this big sphere underneath there which would have held compressed air that moved around through various tubes and powered these devices which he said he was using some kind of force to power and there's probably like some hidden switch or something like that that he would use to turn them on or off and that's why he was the only one who could actually get them to work dale pond the keely motor <laughs> this motor was given 
to one of Keeley's lawyers in the late 1800s. We assume it was given to him or it was part payment or whatever. We don't know exactly. It was real simple. However, the pressure, low pressure, vacuum, and we oscillate it back and forth. So he's explaining how I think water comes into this and it's the suction of the water then creates like a pump with no parts and somehow that produces pressures and there's cavitation and then it moves the piston and it spins things around. My question is, if you've got this all figured out, why don't you just turn it on? Like <laughs> If it works, turn it on so we can all see it just working without any power source whatsoever, producing more power than it's taking in. I would, I would like to see that. Sympathetic vibratory physics. That's the same guy in the video, I guess. Oh, he's quoting Gandhi there. He memorized the periodic table at age 10. Nice, nice one. The Renaissance man, geometry, music, common law, and some other stuff. Sounds like an interesting guy. He reestablished the field of sympathetic vibratory physics, pioneered by Keeley. Keeley's ideas and his machinery were so far ahead of his time that those of the 19th century scientific community were unable to incorporate Mr. Keeley's concept into their model of the natural world. Lost from public view for over a century, these concepts are being reintroduced by Mr. Dale Pond, maker of Dynosphere. What does all this stuff do, Dale? No one with unpure incentive can harness the etheric forces you will introduce. This is a key to remember. I would be interested in the timetable. I wonder if the coming race influenced him because he was obviously already making stuff. You know, he was apparently a good machinist, like these things with all these moving parts. But that idea that there was some force out there that could be put into things and make them work. And and part of the coming race was that the Vrilya could learn and they had evolved to do this through their their psychology and their biology. And that seemed to be part of his uh, M.O. and explaining the machines and presenting them to the public and why they did what they did and why he was the only one that could use them. So I would be interested in looking at the chronology of his work and seeing when those concepts came in, because I bet you they post-date the coming race. Anyway, you know, I do not doubt that there are energy sources and ways of harnessing power in nature that, of course, we have not discovered or refined yet. Like, that is certainly true. Do I believe this guy in the late 1800s had Maybe I shouldn't have made this video. Maybe I should have just gone to bed. If this stuff is supposed to be secret, then why does Dale Pond have a website and all these videos claiming that it works, but that he's not going to actually show us that it works? You know, if, if Keeley could show people that it worked, then Dale Pond should be able to show people that it worked if he's figured out all this. So until you show me, I don't believe a word of it. And I'm going to go with the people who looked firsthand at his workshop and saw what looks like evidence of a bunch of humbuggery. Their interesting question is then, if Blavatsky is channeling all of these things in the secret doctrine and the ascended masters are giving her the keys to this knowledge, she spends a whole entire chapter talking about Keeley and how he has harnessed, you know, what is called in the fictitious work, the coming race, Vril, then what happens to her credibility if that stuff is shown to be false? And the answer is, of course, that it gets flushed down the toilet, right? So that can't be. So so it's such an obvious case of kind of putting your chips on the table and then watching somebody come and knock the table over that I was interested in the response. And demanding the reason why the now discredited discovery of an inter force by the late John Worrell Keeley was treated in the secret doctrine. As a great fact, whereas it was a complete swindle, and how far this contradicts the declaration that, that book was inspired, directed, and corrected by the masters of wisdom. Yeah, so the point is, if the secret doctrine is inspired by these masters, and it's the truth, and it's being channeled, then how do you reconcile that with the fact that Keeley's machines, which were supposedly running on Vril, like, how did that not, how did that get past the master fact-checking in Elena Blavatsky? So... Uh, they realized that that was a problem and they needed to answer it. All that she claims for it is that, romantic as it may seem to many, its logical coherence and consistency entitle it to rank, at any rate, on a level with the working hypothesis so freely accepted by modern science. Okay, so now it's just a hypothesis. <laughs> Further, it claims consideration, not very great many mistakes in her books. Mistakes in fact, in science, in history, in literary quotations, in all of its names, in pages, 
And as Mrs. Besant says in her preface to the third volume of The Secret Doctrine, it contains many statements based on ex exoteric writings, not on esoteric knowledge. And she warns the reader that much to them is certainly erroneous. So what HBB... The inspired book is now full of errors and that's okay. Ah, uh, come on. He writes about Keeley and the new force which he was declared to have okay, discovered comes within this category. Of her own knowledge, she knew nothing about Keeley and the validity of his pretenses. She got her facts at second and third hand from Mrs. Bloomfield Moore, M.R. Evans and other old patrons of Keeley. But the Ascended Masters were supposed to check your work. That's the whole point, isn't it? Is that this stuff is somehow privileged. So now you're going to throw your buddies under the bus because they told you and you were just repeating what they said. I mean, then you could say that about every paragraph in, in all of these different volumes. Like, it's so ridiculous. I, I can't believe people I can't believe it. She took it for granted that he had done the things reported. And in this so do the theosophists then admit that this was garbage? Because there are so many people now who think that he was wrongly accused of fraud. So surely the Ascended Masters could help you sort that out? Slipshod scientific fashion went on to discuss genuinely and expound the finer forces of nature as she knew them to exist, as she had been taught about them by the Masters, as she had learnt about them by practical experimentation. All the wonderful phenomena she showed me and others were produced by the employment of those forces. Her mistake was that she never took the trouble to verify the assertions made by her ignorant, if well-meaning, third parties. And not being a soundly educated person, and as ignorant as a baby of scientific literature and the progress of scientific discovery, galloped off on her pegasus towards the high levels of nature, where she was perfectly at home and when none of us could follow her. Oh, get out of here. What a cop-out. What a cop-out. We're, we're done. You're done. Who else has something interesting to say about this? Okay, this video is about a guy from the late 1800s named John Whirl Keeley. It's been said that if Tesla was 100 years ahead of his time, Keeley was 1,000 years ahead of his time. 1,000 years he ahead built, of his time. He built these, like, fantastic crazy machines and it would resonate with that and then it would he would lock that into the compound disintegrator and then put it up to a huge rock of quartz and it would match the resonance of that of that rock of quartz and then he would slowly move the dot move the uh the resonance because they were matched up it's kind of like when when you hear about the bridges who saw that who saw him do any of that stuff who saw him Take this machine out of his workshop, put it in front of a rock, and disintegrate the rock. Where, where's the actual evidence that any of this stuff happened? Yeah, so there it is. There's a device that supposedly works. Can we ever see it working? You know, there's all kinds of lost civilization stuff about using sound vibrations to move stone and carve things or whatever. So I bet this ties into that too. Anti-gravity. 43 minutes on some wire. So as discussed in previous videos, there are a number of anecdotal accounts from ancient times and even more modern times. Greatest humbug of the 19th century. That's saying a lot, because the 19th century was humbug city, man. Built more than 2,000 machines, gave several headline-grabbing demonstrations in and around Philadelphia, shoot bullets, saw wood, lift weights. You know, you can do a lot with compressed air. Ask anybody who works in a shop that has an air compressor and those tools. And the thing is that once you get the air in there pressurized, it's silent, so... You can make up any story you want, I guess, if you're sneaky enough. There's an actual paper. Became the most notorious perpetual motion scheme of the 19th century, attracting believers and investors for nearly 30 years. Keeley's staunchest supporters, including the author and heiress Clara Moore, the motor was rebuked to the laws of thermodynamics and the parsimonious political economy, pessimistic theology, and anti-feminist psychiatry. Those laws were led to support. It's clear that people like theosophists and others uh, really wanted this thing to work and be true. So there was a big belief component and that probably made it a lot easier for him to separate people from their money. What he has done is certainly quite sufficient to demolish with the hammer of science, the idols of science, the idols of matter with the feet of clay, as his friends justly predict and say of him. This new force, or whatever science may call it, 
the effects of which are undeniable admitted by more than one naturalist and physicist who has visited Mr. Keeley's laboratory and witnessed personally its tremendous effects. Mr. Keeley, of Philadelphia, was, and still is, at the threshold of some of the greatest secrets of the universe. So we're supposed to believe that she just wrote that because somebody told her to? Hi, Who's this? I'm Clara Bloomfield. <laughs> there we go. I would like to tell you a little history about John Keeley. Explosion after explosion occurred, sometimes harmless, at other times laying him up for weeks. He spent two more years Compressed endeavoring air. to devise an automatic control to enable the machine for liberating the energy to be handled by an operator, and in 1884 he stated he was commencing to make real progress. I don't get the sense that theosophists really want to talk about the Keeley motor stuff very much, which I can totally understand. It sounds like there are plenty of other people, or at least a few other people, who do want to talk about the Keeley motor and that it's a amazing technology that uh, the world is just not ready for. So Keeley Motor Company certifies as like a stock certificate or something. Entitled to one share. Yeah, it's stock certificate. Boy, that would be a collector's item. I wonder what eBay has on Keeley Motors. Oh, there you go. Yeah, this stock certificate is worth probably far more now than it was at the time when it was a real company. That would be pretty cool to have, though, wouldn't it? Autographed by Keeley. I don't have $495 for that. My birthday is coming up, though. Oh, is that a photograph of the... That's cool. That's an actual picture of the sphere. After Keeley and Moore died, Moore's son Clarence hired workers and investigators to dismantle Keeley's workshop. They discovered a large cast iron sphere concealed under the floor, a tank for the compressed air. Nice. Uh, explain that one, I guess. Utopian science and technology after Napoleon. Boy, this is a really interesting subject. Anyway, this has probably been a complete mess of a video. That's fine. In The Secret Doctrine, Vril is only mentioned a few times. It's mentioned in an extensive discussion of Keeley and his motor and other inventions that Blavatsky believes sincerely, it seems, not just because her friends told her, run on ether energy that he is somehow channelizing from the nature around him and controlling with his body, and therefore this is support for the concept of real and nature and the spiritual aspects of science and all that. And that's why it gets its own whole chapter. This is not a one-off mention that somebody told me, eh, it turned out to be wrong. To me, that is just as silly support for real as the telephone, but of course that doesn't stop anybody else who is intent on believing this nonsense um, to come later on down the road. I'm not sure what the next things are that I'm going to look at. We do need to look at the Aryan thread and where that comes from and also Atlantis and how that ties into Vril. That's about all the gas I have in the tank for this episode of the Vrilathon. Good night.